This evening, I've been assigned the task of looking at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 3 through 9. Now, this is a very long section. I preached through uh, First and Second Peter a number of years ago, Sunday evenings in our Lord's Day evening worship service, and uh, we spent a number of weeks in this one passage. And so we're just going to have time to look at some of the major themes in this passage, and we'll read from verse 3 through verse 9 of chapter 1. This is the Word of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him, and though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray together. Our sovereign and gracious Lord, we humbly thank You. Lord, we ask that You would make us more humble even through our time together at this conference, Lord, as we learn, as we are challenged, we pray that you would help us to grow in holiness, that is to grow more like Christ. Lord, we are by nature arrogant people. And we ask, Father, that you would help us to come under the ministry of your word and learn from you and love you more and love our neighbor as ourselves as we defend, proclaim, and rest in your truth, as we rest in our Savior, Jesus Christ. All by the power of your Spirit, we pray. Amen. I am not going to conclude that because you are at this conference this weekend that you understand the biblical doctrine of salvation. I'm not going to conclude that you understand the nature of God's sovereignty and the grace of God, the election of God, and the way in which God by His Spirit has saved us. The reason I don't want to assume that is because I was an attendee of Ligonier Conferences for a number of years fighting against the biblical doctrine of salvation. When I first heard about Reformed theology, so-called Calvinism, when I first came to understand some of the words and phrases, I absolutely and in every which way detested and despised it. I hated it. I thought it misrepresented God and His character. I thought it maligned God. I thought it was borderline heresy. I could not for the life of me understand why anyone would hold to such an errant doctrine. For more than two years, I fought against Reformed theology. I fought against so-called Calvinism with every ounce of free will I could muster. <laughs> in my study of Scripture, in my study of the Old and New Testaments and my picking up books on the subject, I would quickly put them down if they did not carefully walk me through clear and thoughtful exegesis of Scripture. I didn't need more explanations. I understood what the doctrine was. I needed someone to prove it from Scripture. And for years I studied and for years I attended conferences like these still not clear, still unsure, and still in many ways fighting against it. 
came to a point of crisis in my life, quite frankly. It was a very severe crisis. It was one night in a field as I was literally crying out to God because I'd come to the point in my life where I either had to reject Scripture or I had to accept and rest in the sovereignty of God overall. As I look back upon that moment in my life, I have often wondered if that was in fact my conversion to Christ. Because you see, I thought I understood. I thought through the words and the phrases and the definitions and explanations of words like foreknown and foreknowledge in Romans 8, I thought that I understood salvation according to Scripture. Those of you who have fought against Reformed soteriology or Calvinism or the biblical doctrine of salvation like I did, you know that we were fighting because we wanted to defend the God of the Bible that we believed would have detested Calvinism and Reformed soteriology like we did. I thought I understood. I thought I grasped the simple message of salvation. I was sitting under the ministry of a man named Sinclair Ferguson who preached a message on the sinfulness of man. And he helped me understand in ways that I had not yet come to understand truly how sinful we are. A lot of people when studying Reformed theology, they start at the wrong place. We need to make sure that when we are studying the doctrine of salvation in Scripture that we have a right, healthy doctrine of the sinfulness of man. Because unless we understand, as Paul says in Romans 3, as he says in Ephesians 2, that we are dead in our sins and trespasses, unless we grasp that rightly, we cannot really understand anything else. If we don't understand God's character and His goodness and His righteous standard, and we don't understand that we are dead in our sins and trespasses, we'll never grasp the rest of it. Part of the problem in the church today is that we do not have a high enough regard for total depravity. We have sort of a moderate view of depravity. We have sort of a moderated view because talking about the deadness of our spiritual state before God is offensive to us. We have to understand that being dead in our sins and trespasses doesn't mean we're a little bit alive. It means we're dead. We can do nothing and we can contribute nothing to our salvation. And as Martin Luther via Dr. Sproul said, that nothing is not a little something. We contribute nothing. And when you understand that and begin to grasp the reality of our relationship before God and that we are not just apart from God, but that we are enemies of God, in opposition to God, that we walked away from God, ran from God, hid from God, and the truth is, is that when God came for us, we killed him. We put the perfect God-man, truly man, truly God, on the cross because we could not bear his righteousness and his exhortation because we are dead naturally in our sins and trespasses. It's only when we understand that deadness can we understand what free will we do indeed have. Do we have free will? The answer is yes. But we have a will and we are free to do that will. We are free to do that which is in accord with our nature. And our nature being dead does not enable us to trust Christ does not enable us to receive Christ, does not enable us to believe. That will, that being made able, only comes to us by the power of the Spirit of God. Now, Peter here is writing to Christians who are hurting. And oftentimes we speak of the early church and the church in the first century is just a persecuted church where the church has been persecuted in one form or another throughout history. But these people were hurting 
Many of them had moved away from their homeland, from their communities, from their kinsmen, from their families. They couldn't find work. They could barely feed their families. They were suffering dreadfully. And Peter begins in writing to them about the hope that they have, the living hope. Not a passing hope, but a hope that is real and genuine and lives. And he begins by talking with them about the salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ. Notice what he says in verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that language of eulogy, eulogia, blessings, praises, and accounts of God's goodness in his character. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again, literally begotten again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That language of being born again is common to all of us, isn't it? Some of you can recall back in the 1980s, sadly, a product likely of the United States. We like to peddle a lot of bad products to the rest of the world, even when it comes to Christianity. And some of you can recall in the 1980s that there was this new phrase that had come about. Maybe it came about in the 70s, but it became more prominent in the 80s where Christians were going around calling themselves not just Christians, but what? Born again Christians. Some of you may have done that. Some of you might still do that, and I realize the reason for that is to distinguish yourself, to make it a crystal clear that you're not just some nominal Christian who doesn't ever go to church. You're not just some Christian in name who just wears a cross around his neck. You're a real Christian. You've had a real experience with Jesus Christ, and you've been born again. But as you study scripture and you understand your theology, you of course know that the phrase born again, to use that in conjunction with the name Christian is superfluous, it's unnecessary. Because a Christian is someone who is born again. A believer is someone who has been born again. And notice the way in which we speak of being born again. We never speak of being born again in the same way that we never speak of having been born naturally into this world. We never speak of it as an act that we ourselves performed. It is always spoken of as we are the passive agents. Just as we were born into this world screaming and crying for breath and comfort and warmth, not doing anything, contributing nothing. So we are born from above, begotten again by the Holy Spirit, quickened, as the old King James Version said, quickened, made alive, regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit in order that we might have the will to believe. And so regeneration The quickening and making alive power of the Holy Spirit is what gives us the will to believe. It's what makes us able to believe. Dead man can't do anything, much less believe. All that dead men do is remain dead. It's when the Spirit makes us alive and brings us up from the grave that he gives us the ability to believe. He gives us mouths that move to proclaim the praises of God. He gives us hearts that now can perceive and understand, minds that can now grasp, and mouths that can confess. The regenerating work of the Holy Spirit is the foundation of our salvation. Too often when we talk about salvation, you'll hear theologians even talk about God, you'll hear them talk about Christ, but so frequently, Do they miss the person and power of the Holy Spirit within us? It is God the Holy Spirit who is the one by the sovereignty of God having chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world that regenerates us and makes us alive. And if he is the one who makes us alive, he is the one who keeps us alive. It is a spirit who sustains us. It is a spirit who is constantly working in us. Peter draws their attention to something that they experienced 
but something that was inward. He draws their attention just like he does later on in the same chapter in verse 23, speaking about our rebirth or being born again, not by a perishable seed, but by an imperishable one. The seed by which we were reborn will not die. And we have been born again to a living hope. Hope is an interesting word, isn't it? I think about hope a lot in my life because there is a tendency in this life, as Christians even, sometimes to feel hopeless. And typically we tend to feel hopeless when we're hurting. Dearly beloved, the feeling of hopelessness is a real feeling that each and every one of us feels at some level and to some degree at some points in our lives and some of us experience it more frequently. It's not a doubt about the future, it's not doubting God and his goodness, but it's a temporal hopelessness. It's a temporal feeling that things are not gonna work out. That your son or your daughter may not ever be healed. that your wife may in fact not live. That your children may never talk to you again. That you'll never overcome the sin that you continue to struggle with. That you'll never find just the right spouse to marry. We are a people surrounded by a message of hopelessness. And sometimes that message of hopelessness and the feeling of hopelessness can accuse and infiltrate every one of us. We need to be honest and we need to be genuine about the reality of the feeling of hopelessness even as we speak to unbelievers because we can identify with the feelings that they have and remind them and help them to understand that there is a hope that goes beyond our feelings. It is a hope that is informed by what we know and what we believe, what God has revealed to us. And that's why for the Christian, we never dwell in that hopelessness. We never just remain hopeless. We never dwell and rest in the mire of hopelessness because God has informed us and he has told us that we can have hope. And it's the spirit of God. Have you noticed? Have you noticed in those moments of hopelessness that you never remain there? even though miseries might be coming at you from every direction, even though you have every reason to experience grief and sadness, despair and hopelessness, the Spirit won't allow you to remain there. He brings you out of it. Sometimes we forget to pray, but he still does it. Sometimes we forget to pray, but the Spirit reminds us of who we are. He reminds us that we are children of God. He reminds us that we don't belong to ourselves, and he reminds us to stop listening to our feelings because our feelings are often the greatest liars. They're real, but they lie to us. And we would do well to heed the instruction of our forefathers that every time we look within And every time we see the corruption and the sin and the hopelessness and the despair within our own hearts, we need to take 10 looks at Christ. Peter wants to encourage them by reminding them of their status, of who they are as the children of God. You know, some of you didn't have a great upbringing with your mom and your dad. Some of you had a great mom, some of you didn't have a great dad, some of you don't even know your parents. But those of us who had a mom or a dad, a grandmother or a grandfather, a pastor, an older figure that we respected in our lives, 
when they would come and put their arm around us, when they held us in their arms, and they told us, I'm going to take care of you. You're going to be okay. We are reminded down to the very depths of our being that we belonged, that we weren't alone. Peter is reminding these hurting, sad, and persecuted Christians who were being tempted by hopelessness and despair that you are children of God. You have been born again by the mercy of God according to that demonstrative work of God in the raising of Jesus Christ. That same power by which he raised Christ is the same power at work in you in bringing you from death to life. Peter goes right into explaining how these trials that they're facing and the testing of their faith is not for nothing. By God's power, you're being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That language of guardianship, that language that reminds us, dearly beloved, that we are not the ones ultimately guarding ourselves. Now, while we are indeed called to guard, we are called to guard our hearts. We are called to guard and observe all that Christ commanded as we teach that which he's commanded to the nations. We are called to guard the faith. We are called to contend for the faith once delivered. But ultimately, God is the one who's guarding us. Too often, we feel as if we have the whole world on our shoulders, that we have to guard and protect everything and everyone around us. Pastors, this is particularly true for us. We feel that we have to be the ultimate guardians of the church. And while we are called to guard, and incidentally our confessions help us to doctrinally guard the faith. But what we have to remember ultimately is that we are not the chief shepherd of the church. That Christ is the chief shepherd. That we are his under shepherds. And we are sub guardians under his headship. And he will make certain that the gates of hell do not prevail. That means that we who are shepherds, who are also sheep and a part of the church, will also be guarded. God is the guardian of our faith. God is the guardian of our souls. God is the guardian who will ensure that we make it to the end. Isn't that what we worry about, most of us? The question that the person asked earlier about how can I be sure that I'm elect? That's a real question. It's a serious question. Each and every person at one stage of his life or another, in one way or another, wrestles with assurance, wrestles with perseverance. Am I going to make it? I can guarantee you this, just about every pastor in this room tonight wonders from time to time, am I going to make it to the end? Do you know that? That the pastors that serve you, the pastors who are in this room, they worry if they're going to make it to the end. Because they know the stories. They've read the testimonies. They've had the friends and the mentors who have let them down, who have fallen into sin and haven't made it. And a lot of times, pastors don't fall into the serious and heinous sin that gets on the front page of the newspapers. Oftentimes, pastors fall into that more respectable sin of pride and arrogance. But God is the one ultimately who guards us. That's why we have to constantly depend upon him, constantly throw ourselves upon him, constantly run to the cross, constantly humbly go before him knowing that he is our guardian. God is the one guarding our faith. He is the one guarding our souls. And ultimately the good news is he's not doing it for us. He's doing it for himself. He's the one after all who created us. He's the one who gave us life. He's the one who gave us breath. That's why we're here. It's why the world exists. The earth exists for us. God made the earth 
for a people to dwell on it, to have a people that would be his own, his own family, his own children, to dwell upon it so that we could live, so that our God could have a people for himself. That's why we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. God is guarding us not for our ultimately our own sakes, but for his own sake. Isn't that beautiful news? That God doesn't need us, but he wants us. And the good news is that he wants each of his children as much as he wants the rest. He doesn't want me any more or less than he wants anyone else. Doesn't matter how poor it doesn't matter the class, it doesn't matter the age, it doesn't matter the education, it doesn't matter the country, it doesn't matter the ethnicity. God wants each of us and each of his children the same, just as every mother and father want each of their children to know how much we love them. Peter reminds us that in this, we rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. It's interesting how Peter and Paul especially, we see this throughout the New Testament, how often when they're speaking of trials, have you noticed this? When they're speaking of of grieving and trials, they'll speak of it sometimes in terms of for a little while. Paul, 2 Corinthians, speaks of this light, momentary affliction? Well, why is it that they're doing that? One of the reasons they're doing this is because they're trying to help us put eternity into perspective. That the suffering that we face now, and yes, it is necessary, and that connotes that it's God and his sovereignty who by his perfect will is permitting this suffering, allowing this suffering, and ultimately has foreordained this suffering, yet neither the author nor approval of evil, that God is mysteriously bringing this suffering into our lives, but it's to remind us that it's just for a time. Some of us who have suffered and have been through trials have wondered when they're ever going to end. Some of us have been through trials that we thought might only last a week or two or a few months, but they go on and on and on, seemingly with no relief. And we cry out, Christ, come. Jesus, come soon. Because they seem to last forever. But in terms of eternity, we have to remember, we have to inform our feelings that these trials and this grieving that we experience is but for a moment, is but for a short time. It is a light, momentary affliction, especially in contrast with the eternal weight of glory that awaits us. So Peter says, we rejoice. It's much like Paul says in Romans 5, 3 through 5, we rejoice in our sufferings. How many of you, when you were younger and you read that, you thought, yeah, right. I don't believe that. How many of you, when you were younger as a Christian, you would hear older Christians say, well, I went through this very difficult time of suffering in my life, and they described the suffering that they endured, and you thought, that must be absolutely miserable. I'm sure that will never happen to me. And you listen to their story, and you hear them talk about the blessing that it was and how God used it in their lives, and even how they might say, I wouldn't ever trade that suffering for anything. And you think when you're a younger Christian, you are lying. You are being disingenuous. You are trying to make us think that it was all fine and then you go through it yourself. And then you suffer. And you realize that that time of suffering made you rejoice in ways that you never had before. It drew you closer to your Lord as a 
dear and close companion in ways you'd never known him or experienced before. Rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance character and character hope and hope does not disappoint. It doesn't let us down. It doesn't put us to shame. Why? Why doesn't our hope let us down? Why doesn't it disappoint us? Why doesn't it make us look like a shame before the world? It's because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. The world looks at trials and they look at miseries and they try to escape them and try to run from them. We as Christians know that being in Christ means that we will share in some measure in the fellowship of his suffering. That's why James in James 1, 2 through 4 doesn't talk about if you encounter trials, but when you encounter trials of all sorts of kinds, various kinds, knowing Knowing what trials do, what do they do? They produce perseverance. They produce endurance. And when endurance or perseverance has its perfect work in us, we'll be perfect and complete, whole, lacking nothing. Peter is trying to remind them that in this trial, in these persecutions, we are a people who rejoice. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire. This is the work of a saying, gold, melting it down, getting out all the impurities to to test it and to prove it and to get it down to its most pure form and essence may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What's Peter talking about there? Look at verse seven. So that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now upon first reading this, it's hard to escape when we hear about praise and honor. It's hard to escape the notion that Peter must be talking about the praise and honor and glory that we will give to Christ, that we will give to God. Because that is naturally how we think of praise and honor and glory. And we understand, don't we, that our trials are not just for us. We understand that God gives us trials to humble us. A lot of times, Christians, when they enter a trial, they just try to sort of let it roll off their shoulders or roll off their backs. They, they try to make light of the trials. You ever known people like this? They're going through a very difficult trial and they pretend that it's nothing when we know it must be miserable. Now, many times people are actually in shock. They're experiencing a type of trauma. This is something that many of us can identify in others and friends and colleagues and those in our church. We know that they're going through trauma. They're experiencing a deep shock and so they don't know how to respond. But trials, trials are meant for something. They're not, they're not meant to make us run from them. They're not meant to make us exploit them. That's very common today, especially on social media. We have a trial, let's let everybody know about it so that we'll get attention from them. Trials are meant to humble us. We don't always know why we're getting a trial. We don't know if it's discipline. We don't know all the reasons. We can't read the mind of God. We can't always figure out a trial. And sometimes that's what we do. We think if we can just figure out the trial, then we'll have the answer. And that's, 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 that's because we like to control it. We like to play God with our trials. You notice that? Because if we can figure it out, then we can kind of get it under control. And then we can have it in its right little place. And if you ever noticed when we try to do that, God doesn't let that trial let up too easily. Because the goal of trials is to get us on our knees. The purpose of trials is to break us. The purpose of trials is to make us cry out, Abba, Father. The purpose of trials is to draw us closer to our Lord and Savior. How many times in our lives do we pray that God would increase our faith? 
How many times do we pray, Lord, may my faith be stronger? How many times in our lives do we pray, Lord, give me wisdom, give me humility? Well, how does God do that often? He does it through trials. He does it through testing. That's why praying for humility and praying that God would increase our faith can often be some of the scariest and most frightening prayers we can pray. But trials aren't just for us, they're for others. For those around us and those in our lives that we can help and those that we can counsel and comfort and point their eyes to Christ. But you see, ultimately, our trials are for God. Our trials ultimately aren't just for us, they're not just for others. Our trials ultimately are for God. Remember the question, why did God make us? Why are we here? Why do we exist as human beings? Why did God make a mass of people made in his image? Not because he needed us. Not because there was something in him deficient. God is sufficient in and of himself. We believe in the aseity of God. We believe that God is independent, that he does not require anyone or anything. So why did God create us? It's because he wanted us. He desired a people for himself, a bride for his son, the groom. Just like any parent wants to be close to her daughter, her son. Just as any father wants to be close to his daughter or son. So God desires to be close to his children. And one of the ways in which God draws us close to him is through trials. Because it is only through trials, it is only through our weakness that God helps us to recognize how truly needy and weak we are. It is only then when he draws us closer and we recognize that he's been there all along as our closest companion too often we feel that God's at a distance from us, even in trials, that he's not listening to us, he's not hearing our prayers, when in fact he is right there and he is drawing us closer to say, you are my beloved child. I know that what is good for you is to make you more dependent on me. That's why Paul could say in 2 Corinthians, that's why I heard from the Lord, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. And that's why Paul and only those Christians who have truly suffered can really understand the depths of what Paul meant when he said, when I am weak, then I am strong. Well, here's what's interesting about this passage. This language of praise and glory and honor, some scholars, because of the construction of the way in which Peter wrote this, you'll notice that Peter doesn't say to the praise and glory and honor of God. Did you notice that? He doesn't say to the praise and the glory and honor of Christ. Some scholars suggest that what Peter actually might be saying here is that when we see Jesus Christ, when we see him face to face at his coming, at his appearing, at his revelation, we will be the children of God who will receive the praise and honor and glory under Christ and under God, but that this praise and honor will in some mysterious way be unto us. It's a mystery, but it is interesting to consider that we who have made it through, that we who have been tested, that we who have been persecuted, and those who are here in the UK and those who are here throughout Europe, you understand far more what persecution is like than anything that we've ever begin, begun to experience in the United States. We are just on the cusp of beginning to understand what you all have been experiencing in many ways for many years. 
And one of the greatest ways of the church in the UK and Europe being persecuted in so many ways is by Christians being thought as complete, foolish, ignorant idiots. Well, it's begun in America. And it'll be good for the purifying of the church in the States as well. As God will weed out those who do not really belong to him but have been enjoying the benefits and the blessings of being so-called nominal Christians. Peter is speaking to those among the persecuted who are truly born again, who truly know the Lord Jesus Christ and whose faith is being truly and deeply tested. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Have you ever experienced in your life as a Christian the inability to express how grateful you really are? I feel that way most days when it comes to expressing my gratefulness for my wife. I think all of us in one way or another have people in our lives that we have a difficult time expressing how grateful we are for them. If you have children, you can't even begin to properly express how much you love them. We have words that are inadequate. We don't know what to say. One of my favorite lines of one of my favorite hymns is from the very ancient hymn, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. When we sing, what language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend? Because when you have hurt and suffered, and when you have experienced the friendship of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you've come to know him as your truest and greatest companion. You truly have no words. It is a heart broken and grateful that he took you an unworthy, undeserving, and wretched sinner and made you his child forever. And that's why only we who understand what it is to be truly dead. That's why we who understand what it is to be a true wretch can only rightly understand when we sing Amazing Grace. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we ask that you would help us to draw closer to you, knowing that you will draw closer to us as we worship you as we rest in you, and as we walk by your spirit all for your glory. We thank you, Lord. In Christ's name we pray, amen.